Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susanna Doyle. I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Trinity Development and Alumni. And you're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar entitled Beyond Greenwashing, Businesses Responding to the Climate Crisis. The speakers today include Sheila Cannon, Assistant Professor of Social Entrepreneurship at Trinity College Dublin, uh, John Weekly, founder and CEO of Vita Green Fund, as well as alumnus of Trinity, and Ahmad Muazam, co-founder and CEO of Evoco. The webinar today will last about an hour, including enough time to take questions from the audience. Please feel free to send through those questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on Zoom. And if you're viewing on YouTube Live, you're welcome to input questions in the comments box as well. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing at the TCD uh, YouTube channel, sorry, TCD Alumni YouTube channel. And also please note that we are using Zoom generated automatic subtitles for this webinar. To turn these on or off, please click, click the live transcript CC closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and click show or hide subtitles. Now I'd like to introduce our MC who will lead the discussion today and who will also introduce our other speakers. Dr. Sheila Cannon has been my good friend for the past 30 years. After her undergraduate studies, Sheila worked in the nonprofit sector and peace building organizations for over 12 years, first in the Balkans and then in Ireland. She was director of development at the Glen Cree Center for Peace and Reconciliation and program director at the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeast Europe. And it was through this work that inspired her to return to academia and pursue her PhD at Trinity. Her doctoral research on peace building organizations received the 2015 Rudney Memorial Award for Outstanding Dissertation in Nonprofit and Volunteer Research. Currently, Sheila is Associate Director of the Global Business Undergraduate Degree Program at Trinity, and she's also the Director of Engagement at the Trinity Center for Social Innovation. She conducts research on and teaches about the third sector, including social enterprises, nonprofits, and civil society organizations. And she has studied contexts including marriage equality movement, reproductive rights, digital disruption, just transition, and sustainability. And just yesterday, Sheila received the annual Trinity College Civic Engagement Award. So congratulations, Sheila, and welcome today to our webinar. Brilliant. Thank you, Susanna. That's a lovely introduction. And I'm looking forward to talking about our theme. So today, um, our theme is about how businesses can engage with the climate crisis, how they can adapt, what they need to do, and innovative ways of changing. So I'm going to provide a little bit of an introduction to that theme, um, and then introduce you to the speakers. So basically, we have already a scientific consensus on the human cause um, nature of the climate crisis, and that we have eight years to reach carbon neutrality if we're to meet the Paris Agreement, um, which, which is the limit of 1.5 degrees warming that would keep us within a safe um, range. Now, uh, scientific consensus doesn't mean that all of the research is agrees. It just means that if you did a literature review of all of the research on um, uh, environmental changes over the last 50 years, there is a consensus or an overwhelming message that humans have caused a uh, climate crisis and that the globe is warming due to fossil fuel emissions. Responses to that. Many of the responses have been around what we need to change uh, technically. So there is a book and a project and a website called Drawdown. And it is a collaboration by 70 scientists. And they look at all the possible responses we could have to the climate crisis. And they rank them, they choose uh, 100 responses and they rank them according to what would have the most impact. So technically, we know exactly what to do. But behind all of this is social change. And not just incremental change, but massive, systemic, uh, drastic social change. Um, and I would argue that is the real challenge that we have in front of us, is how do we bring about that kind of social change? So my research has looked at social change and how we use business models to bring about social change. Um, so this brings together a few different areas of research. Um, I mean, on the one hand, most of what we know about social change comes from social movement literature and the environmental movement has been going for 50 years. Um, but organizing <clears throat> in general is organized into three sectors. So the first sector being government, 
the second sector being profit making businesses, and the third sector being all the other types of civil, civil society organizations, such as trusts, philanthropic foundations, nonprofits, charities, um, and many social enterprises. But social enterprise really reflects this big trend in the third sector of commercializing um, or the marketization of third sector organizations. And then we have another big uh, trend in the second sector of profit making businesses becoming more social or moving from a, stakeholder, a shareholder uh, approach to a wider stakeholder approach. So not only looking at the financial bottom line, but including also social and environmental impacts in in the, the very purpose of the organizations. So today we're going to look and consider how businesses might be part of that big systemic type change, not how businesses might become carbon neutral, as many of them are, but more profound approaches to those questions and to the changes that we have to make. So to help us approach this challenge today, we have two, um, social entrepreneurs uh, who have uh, a track record of outstanding and creative initiatives that combine social and environmental goals towards climate adaptation. So I'll introduce both of them now and then they'll each have a chance to talk a little bit about their organizations and then we will come back together. Uh, and at that point you can throw in some questions for us and we'll have a bit of a discussion. So first up we have Ahmad Muazim who is the CEO of Avoco, which he co-founded with Hugh Weldon, uh, who both completed their bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering at Trinity College. And while they were on their degree, they came up with the idea for Avoco. Uh, and then since they've graduated, they have developed the organization, attracted investment, launched uh, the initiative, and are, are growing and scaling uh, day by day. Um, if, uh, Ahmad will tell you more specifically about the the, the initiative, but it is an app that helps you track and improve or reduce your environmental impact of your grocery shopping. Um, and then next up, we will have John Weekliam. So he's the founder and CEO of Vita, as well as the Vita Green Impact Fund. So John completed his bachelor's degree at Trinity in management science, and then went on to do his master's in finance at the University College Cork. So while setting up bank training programs in Eritrea, John set up VITA, an international development NGO in 2000, and then in Ethiopia in 2005. So he has a long and in-depth experience um, of working in international development and some of the challenges as well as opportunities that that can um, lead to, which brings us to the VITA Green Impact Fund. So this is an investment opportunity that has social, environmental, and financial impact. So how do we combine those three? He set this up in two, uh, 2016, and he's, he's been growing ever since with uh, international and Irish investors. Um, and this builds on his work in international development. So first we will go to Ahmad and we will uh, share his presentation. You're very welcome, Ahmad. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Sheila. Um, looking forward to, uh, to speaking about a bit about Avaco. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So hi, I'm Ahmed Mwazam, CEO and co-founder of Avaco, and our mission is to empower consumers to eat within planetary boundaries. So our journey began back in 2017. Hugh and I were finishing our master's in mechanical engineering. And we were at that point in our careers where we were trying to decide what we wanted to dedicate our uh, professional careers to and what direction we were taking. We were both really passionate about sustainability. And I think it was just after the Paris Climate Accord was signed that conversations around it became more and more on topic for us. And somewhere along the lines, we started becoming obsessed with behavioral change as a potential solution for the climate crisis. And I know what you're thinking, kind of, when you're thinking of us as mechanical engineers, naturally you'd gravitate towards renewable energies, electric vehicles, different solutions like that. But for us, really what we felt was if we could get more people engaged and changing their behaviors, we could drive the systems change really required uh, to tackle the climate crisis. And looking at behavioral change, we naturally gravitated towards the food industry, and that was for a couple of reasons. So food accounts for a massive 27% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's an area where a massive impact can be made. Food is also something that everybody can relate to as everybody eats, but not everybody can afford an electric vehicle. 
and he felt it was really important to democratize any solution that we had in this area. And finally, and most importantly, when it came to behavioral change, food is something that we interact with every single day, multiple times a day. So looking at food as, um, as our starting point and realizing that to meant behavioral change we needed, we started looking at the science and what was the science telling us that we needed to do. So researchers say that uh, developed nations' diets need to reduce in emissions by a massive 75% if we are to be in line with the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Now that's a scary figure and it's something that, um, and it shows that we need such a massive shift to more sustainable diets if we're ever going to be uh, within planetary boundaries. And to be honest, at times that leaves me overwhelmed and it leaves me scared. But what gives me, um, I suppose, a bit of optimism is that globally 85% of us are willing to make that change. We just need a helping hand to, to being able to do that. We just need to understand what individual actions we can take to contribute towards uh, these targets. Now, what's also positive is that we, we are, um, we come from a generation that's been obsessed about tracking everything, everything from kind of our fitness, our productivity, steps, calories, you name it, everything. And apps like Fitbit, Strava, MyFitnessPal have completely changed the way we think, we act and speak about health and fitness. They made it easier by breaking down what we needed to do on a daily basis to something as simple as say 10,000 steps or 2,500 calories. And we felt that if we could bring that, those kind of learnings into the food industry and help people understand what they could individually do on a daily basis, that the 75% reduction wouldn't seem so difficult. So we developed Avaco, a mobile app that allows you to track, improve and offset your food uh, emissions. And the way it works is simple. You simply take a photograph of your food shopping receipt. We give you a score based on how nutritious and climate friendly your purchases are. We give you personalized tips on how you can improve the next time you shop. And then you can also plant native woodland directly through the app to offset your food emissions and make your purchase carbon neutral. So we've partnered with um, a Swiss life cycle assessment company called Eternity to provide the best in class data for us. And also an Irish uh, not-for-profit go carbon neutral um, to allow you to offset and plant trees directly here in Ireland. So um, I'll leave it there just as a little introduction to kind of where we came from and uh, I'll hand it over to John then. Thank you, Sheila, for that lovely introduction and congratulations to you on your award and to Suzanne for this latest inspiring idea from Trinity and to Alex and everybody who made this possible. Ahmed, that's a wonderful project with the VOCO you have created. An opportunity on the kind of business to consumer B2C level. Um, as the slogan goes, you know, we're all part of the solution when it comes to COVID, but that's even more true when it comes to climate action and you are offering a product to enable people to take personal responsibility. And from our side, we're really looking at a solution at the business to business level, which is to say, um, sorry, I'm flicking between slides there, which is to say, uh, we have an offering that allows Irish business to purchase carbon credits, carbon offsets from our Green Impact Fund, which allows businesses to take responsibility and aim towards zero carbon. And while doing so, and by purchasing carbon offsets from our Green Impact Fund, also addressing global poverty and the African predicament, which is really something uh, very sad that this wonderful continent is suffering from the impact of climate change and what we have contributed in the West to climate change. So we're offering something that allows business to be part of the solution and stop being part of the problem of climate change. VITA is a small organization working in international development. I work 14 years in Eritrea, which is one country, a beautiful little country that is blighted by climate change with almost no trees and forestation left in the country as a result of tree cutting. Africa as a continent is uh, three times the size of Europe, one and a half times the population. And the problem with Africa's geographic size and the problem of resource gaps, financial and otherwise, is that 750 million people living in rural Africa do not have access to what we take for granted. We can turn on our tap, we can turn on our electricity, we can turn on our Zoom for this call, and it's automatic. 
750 million people, the population of our continent, are carrying firewood for hours daily, are carrying water for hours daily for the want of these basic necessities. This is a, a massive global issue. The World Bank estimates the damage of just using inefficient traditional cook stoves at $2.4 trillion globally. The social impact is drastic. It means women and particularly women and girl children fetching these items daily, suffering enormous illness from contaminated water, from smoke inhalation from the inefficient cook stoves, and a multitude of livelihood and daily drudgery problems that we couldn't imagine. It's not just social, it's environmental as well, because the cost of cutting trees to provide firewood, to boil your unclean water, to cook your food, that deforestation has cost Africa dearly. And as I said, Eritrea, 1% of tree cover remaining in the country, almost completely denuded of trees. So how do VITA and the Green Impact Fund propose to address the problem? Well, in, on your screen there, you can see a cook stove, a woman in the home with her cook stove. This item is, is the fulcrum of what we're proposing. If we can provide one cook stove for 20 euros, that is efficient. It can save two tons of cutting trees for firewood annually. Two tons of tree cutting saved is two tons of carbon emission saved. Two tons of carbon emission saved is two carbon credits. And say this is the carbon offset product. If we can sell those carbon credits for five euros. Now, the Irish Department of Finance estimates the cost of one ton of carbon at 250 euros. We're talking about five euros to save a ton of carbon in the rural African context. If we can sell those two tons for five euros, that means 10 euros of revenue annually. Over two years, we have paid for the cost of the cook stove. That's the business proposition. And Africa, which has not contributed to climate change, instead of going our fossil fuel route, our industrial route, our big grid electricity water, the route that has caused so much damage, there are opportunities for Africa to be truly tran uh, transformational and to go straight to a low carbon economy, even as Africa develops uh, to the level we've achieved in Europe. So what is the proposition in our case? It's all about innovation. We can't do business as we did before. So on the left side of your screen, as you see there, innovative financing. So we're raising investment from Irish business and international business to invest in cook stoves and water and tree planting, which will generate massive social benefit, but also the environmental benefit of generating carbon savings, measuring the carbon savings with gold standard, which is a global standard, selling the carbon to Irish business and to global business and using those funds to repay the investors. Not only does carbon finance repay the investor, it actually can be used to subsidize the cook stove to the woman in the home and to make it affordable. And by making it affordable and by using what we call a community led model where every single household across communities is enabled to participate and to access a cook stove, we can create massive scale. And it's scale that Africa needs because we're talking about 750 million people without these basic building blocks. So looking at the social enterprise model that we're using, we have on the left side, again, if you, if you can see your screen, we're raising 27 million euros at this uh, first stage in the process. Those funds being raised from Irish business, including the likes of Cantor Fitzgerald, including companies from the leasing, the air leasing and other sectors, raising 27 million and applying those funds to those development projects I have outlined. Provision through the Vita field offices in Ethiopia and Eritrea and true partners, reaching the woman in the home with the cook stove, the family 
in the rural communities of Ethiopia, Eritrea and five other countries, providing clean water, repairing broken water points, planting trees, we will invest that 27 million to reach 4 million people in the next three years. And in reaching those people with, their, with the cook stoves and water that they need, generating 3 million tonnes of carbon emission, which is the equivalent of 5% of Ireland's national carbon footprint. And in selling those carbon credits, we will repay the investors and reinvest the surplus funds to create a circular model that allows Irish business to address its CSR and address its climate responsibility in a package while tackling the global issues of hunger, climate change and low carbon development. So thanks for listening and look forward to the questions. I pass it back to Sheila. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, John and Ahmed. That's really interesting. Um, clearly, we can see how both social goals and environmental goals interact and work together. And what I find interesting is that you often have arguments within um, that research that corporate sustainability should, should be understood as a concept separate from corporate responsibility. And so responsibility would be the social bit and sustainability is the environment. But obviously, I mean, it's very hard to <clears throat> disassociate the two. And I think your examples really show how those two things are intertwined. Perhaps I could come to Ahmad first uh, with a question. Uh, your Avaco's approach. Uh, recently, there was an article in The Guardian that 100 businesses are to blame for 71% of the carbon uh, emissions and that one of the strategies of the kind of resistance against climate change and the protectionism around fossil fuel industry is to shift the responsibility onto the individual. So if you're taking a very individual approach, how would you respond to that accusation that you're feeding into this approach that it's the individual to blame uh, rather than the company, rather than the industries? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Sheila. Um, I suppose I'd kind of probably reframe the challenge slightly. So I don't think we should be at, at this stage, we should be going around pointing uh, different fingers or putting the responsibility solely on consumers or uh, solely on industry either. I definitely think a lot of change needs to come at that level from, um, from those large companies that are admitting they're the ones who can make a massive impact. But overall, as a society, we actually do need a large amount of systems change. And that does start from the individual. So if we say that, um, I suppose, an individual can't make a difference, uh, I suppose it's the sum of all those different parts that's going to make the, that's going to make the big difference and that's going to make these new in, uh, low carbon uh, industries more viable and, make, um, and drive that system change that we actually need. So I definitely think uh, they work in tandem and, um, and particularly for the sort of people that we're helping with our app as well, they, it's, it is that helplessness and that overwhelmed feeling that they get from climate change that we're trying to really help them and be a part of the climate movement. Everybody's looking to do their part and they're just looking to know where they can start as well. So giving them, I suppose, a method where they can actually make individual change, but then a voice also to be able to show on a larger scale um, what we can do. I think that's really what we're about then. Great. And a follow-up question to that. Um, so I'm using Avoco, let's say. I'm using the app. I'm taking a picture and I'm getting these, this advice that, okay, I should buy organic veggies instead of my cheap imported meat products, whatever. Um, is it a solution for the wealthy? Like who can afford, while the more environmental products are more expensive, um, how, do you, how do you deal with that issue? How can this kind of behavior change reach more people? Yeah, so definitely, um, definitely on the kind of, um, I suppose, on the kind of top level, uh, most of the emissions are coming from you know, the wealthy developed nations. So that is where a lot of that dietary change is going to have to come. So definitely on a global scale, it is, it is uh, targeted towards those type of nations, Europe, North America, um, we're the ones who actually need to reduce by 75%. A lot of the world is actually within uh, the boundaries themselves. But then going down into within those countries themselves, it's a big misconception that actually you need to spend a lot more to um, have a low carbon diet. 
often when you're moving towards more plant-based products um, and avoiding your animal-based products, that you are cutting down on cost there as well. And also, like for like, the price isn't just an indicator um, of how sustainable a product is. A lot of it has, uh, a lot of that premium that we're paying is because brands who are more sustainable have identified that people who are really looking for solutions are willing to pay that bit extra. And I suppose um, it is making their business models uh, more viable. So I wouldn't say the two are mutually exclusive, that it's just for, uh, um, I suppose, more wealthy consumers. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, tips and tricks you can use to uh, have a low carbon diet on a budget. Okay, thanks, Ahmed. So overall, Avoco is an organization that helps the individual reduce their carbon footprint. And then Vivita Impact Fund, um, once you've reduced as much as you can, you, you can then offset, right? Uh, you don't want to offset instead of cutting back, instead of reducing. So if I come to John now with a question, there, there are a lot of criticisms of carbon offsetting. It's, uh, there are, you know, you think it, it, sometimes it's presented as kind of easy as if you can go out and purchase anything that you can purchase a carbon offset, but of course, not every carbon offset is equivalent. There's many different things you can buy. You can, even if it's tree planting, um, there's all sorts of different ways of planting trees. And how do you prove additionality that you're not paying for trees that would have been there anyway, so then you're not actually offsetting. And then there's a, there's a million other issues as you're well familiar with. How do you um, kind of address those concerns in your approach to carbon offsetting? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, greenwashing is part of the great corporate kind of, what would you call this kind of scandal of the last 300 years that companies have been able to profit maximize at a cost to the climate, as a cost to the people on the planet, sort of we are reaching a tipping point where kind of excuses and and window dressing and greenwashing are no longer acceptable. Thankfully, there is more accountability out there, and we work with Gold Standard, who have a protocol we follow that ensures that there is additionality, there is sustainability, etc. And and that is part of the solution. But in addition. We've also uh, got our own protocol that we're finalizing that ensures that at no point in the process are we simply creating credits. For example, we will not sell credits to companies, fossil fuel emitting giants that will just use the credits as a, as a way to keep profit maximizing, uh, buy a cheap solution, uh, et cetera. So you've got to be progressing towards zero carbon. That's part of our, our protocol. And, there are many ways and means that you can ensure that you're bringing proper value and additionality, including the likes of um, satellite imagery of tree cover. You're not just saving trees, but you're ensuring the reversal of deforestation. So it is very complicated. Evidence is necessary uh, all the way through the process. And I think we are on a better era on this planet where, where data is king, evidence is necessary. And uh, as I said, the old bad habits seem to be on the way out gradually. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So you've given that a lot of thought, I can see. Um, just, I'm sure there are people uh, watching and thinking, we're making the same old mistakes with international development work of importing solutions uh, to issues from the wealthy world to the uh, less developed countries. And I saw on your slide, you had like a top down approach and a bottom up approach. And anyone familiar with community development work or international development work, that knows how it's kind of evolved over time and we've understood the mistakes we've made of, uh, uh, of kind of imposing, um, importing uh, solutions. Could you tell us a bit more about your bottom-up approach and how the people who have the least voice are part of the decision-making process, if they are? Sure. Very good, yeah. Well, it's a, it's, it's a blight on our own aid sector that we've really allowed ourselves to be part of the patronage and the Western kind of machinery that has ridden roughshod over traditional societies and over the poorest of people who, who did not need our interventions, which came in from the top down and often imposed a lot of baggage, corruption, patronage, um, taking the empowerment away from people. Simply, it's, it's still a huge problem in the aid sector. Now the community led model was uh, this CLT called, uh, CLTS is an Indian gentleman called Kamal Kar who has introduced it to 71 countries. He's a global luminary, very much supported by Ireland. And his whole approach is around 
enabling the community to take ownership, take responsibility, to decide for themselves the solution, to implement the solution, whether that be latrines and avoiding open defecation, which is a sort of a traditional uh, practice in some parts, equally for cook stoves so that everyone uses the cook stove, which saves the trees and everyone stops using the traditional cook stove by a consent of the community, the children, the adults, women, men, and leaders are generated uh, through the process who, who will guide that. So instead of us being there trying to be the big brother, the big white savior and all those bad habits, we, we should be there as the invisible hand that allows people to take, take that lead. And the cook stove is a wonderful uh, opportunity to do that. They're made locally, they're supplied locally, they're distributed by the people to the people, uh, the payment, et cetera, is all local, it's affordable. Uh, the, the richest people in the community will cover the cost for the poorest. And there's all of that social solidarity, which is allows uh, any intervention to be more sustainable. So that's the kind of this community led approach is essentially our best effort to make the process participatory and by itself that can enable scale to emanate from the 100% adoption that we're getting for the cook stove uh, in, in this process. Super, thank you. Thanks, John. Staying on the same theme of combining social and environmental uh, goals or issues, in, in Dublin, we've had some serious protests by Irish farmers over the last year, two years. Um, and I, going back here to Ahmad and Ivaco, if you're encouraging people to move to a plant-based diet through your app, which has a lower carbon footprint, Obviously, this has social impact that is unforeseen or that is known. What do you do about that social impact? I mean, farming in Ireland, there's a long tradition and culture and history. Um, so do you just tell farmers to plant trees or how, how do you deal with the social impacts of the, of the social changes that you're proposing? Yeah, I suppose um, as we're coming through uh, this kind of transition and we're trying to drive this different type of systems change it is going to require uh, new industries to kind of pop up and some older industries uh, to not operate as they would have before or um, um, to kind of change their practices as well and I think um, Mary Robinson talks about a lot about kind of climate justice and kind of giving people the support both on people who are kind of being affected uh, by the uh, environmentally by the damages of climate change but then also socially as well how they can transition still have kind of pride in their life and um, how they work as well and I think it's really having that open conversations and getting farmers a part of that conversation to understand how I suppose they can diversify um, what they're doing into I suppose industries that are low carbon or um, using the competencies that they already have so like um, some, um, I suppose, meat companies have also started diversifying into kind of plant-based meats. Like say, um, I'd be a big fan of the meat-free Denny sausages. They're ones that, um, they're ones that I suppose are also um, kind of diversifying that portfolio and looking towards the future. Because I think um, we're, we are going to have a transition to a point where we are producing less, uh, less meat and less animal-based products. And that's just, the, that's, that is a non-negotiable. And now the conversation should be around how do we support the people who are going to be socially negatively affected by it? And um, how can we help them transition that both on a kind of personal level, but also on an economic level as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I wonder if I can ask a question that perhaps both of you could address. And that is, you both have now a, lot, a long experience of trying to balance social, environmental and financial goals in a very different way than multinational corporations have to report against the triple bottom line. You've, you know, you genuinely wrestle with these different goals um, and figure out how to create the most value in these different ways. What advice would you give to either multinationals that are not social enterprises, that, but, but want to become more social uh, and environmentally friendly, or to SMEs uh, who, who also want to make similar changes? Like what, what might be the barriers that they could face or ways that they might overcome it? Perhaps uh, we could go to John first uh, to address that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank God I got in ahead of him, but I'm sure you would have had a brilliant answer. Uh, I, I, I would say, Ahmed, you're dealing a lot with Irish business and uh, Denny sausages. If they have any carbon offset left at the end of your exercise, pass them on to us and we'll finish them off. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I'd say that uh, really business, the, the mindset has to shift really because there's always the cheapest path to the easiest solution. That there's, a, there's a kind of cynicism pervades business in, in Ireland and elsewhere and very, very little ideology, very little progressive thinking, joined up thinking. It's, it's, it's amazing. We sometimes think the civil service is bureaucratic, but when we see the corporate mindset, it's all about ticking boxes and getting, getting the job done. Now, we've dealt with some wonderfully progressive companies, and I think, uh, can I do a bit of uh, advertising? Kios Chris, wonderful, took a really progressive attitude, said, look, not only the farming, but the production of Chris should be, should be carbon zero. Why don't we combine that with supporting potato farmers as well as uh, offsetting our footprint? So by combining both their, their carbon responsibilities, their CSR and their, their knowledge and their technologies around farming, they, they have joined all those dots together. Fantastic work. You know, a number of companies like that are ahead of the game. But why would you, for example, apply your CSR budget so you help maybe a priest in El Salvador, or you might help an orphanage in Timbuktu. You know, why would you not combine that with your climate responsibility? So we're saying, come, come our way. Of course, we would be trying to sell our wares like everyone does. Uh, but we have a product that is a TBL for you, triple bottom line, that does provide an opportunity to put your CSR money into the very same work that will address your carbon footprint. And by combining that, you could report in, with metrics with evidential uh, material against those. Now, the European Union requires companies to report on the triple bottom line. So companies now need to think of joined up solutions that actually address the audit need to report on all three. So um, we just be, be trying to offer companies that broader way of thinking and that more joined up way of thinking. Great, super. So I see that there's quite a lot of questions coming in on the Q&A here. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll read out a couple that relate to Vita first, and then I'll read out a couple that relate to Avaco. Uh, because if we, if we go one question at a time, we'll, we'll run out of time here. So um, regarding um, uh, cook stoves. So are the cook stoves manufactured, maintained and recycled locally? I'm wondering if the local economy is empowered or bypassed by the supply of cook stoves. Hang on, I'll ask another one that's related. So that's around the cook stoves and then like social impact of that. Now, Penny asks um, around social behavior and adoption of new technologies is key to making the technical solutions work. Cook stoves address one problem, deforestation, but create another, poor indoor air quality and chronic health conditions. Maybe you can clarify that, John, if that's the case. Yeah, how very, is the very issue, good question. I how is the any... issue of user adoption addressed in your model, and is there a commensurate environmental benefit from targeting the use of gas stoves and heating in the developed world? So there's a few around um, the cook stoves in particular, like, Question Thanks, on. Penny. You got me there. There's some good questions. <laughs> um, actually, the, the cook stoves are produced locally. That's important because we've set up women's cooperatives in southern Ethiopia, 50, uh, to a 50 women in a cooperative, and they produce them from mostly local materials. Sometimes they need cement from one of the cook stove items. Uh, there's also a local plant that produces one type of cook stove. So there are ways, rather than importing or bringing in from outside the community to provide job creation opportunity uh, as well. Uh, the question in relation to the sustainability and the, the, the side effects, it is very true that a traditional, cooks, a traditional cook stove is totally inefficient. Uh, an improved cook stove is an incremental step towards a final solution, which is essentially um, electrification, hopefully from a renewable source. Um, and if you include a chimney, which we do in the case of Eritrea, for example, you also eliminate the smoke pollution. Uh, and we're introducing a chimney now in, in, in Ethiopia in the next phase. So yeah, very good questions. Uh, ultimately, these gas stoves are very expensive. And so really you're looking at trying to be also commercial. You can't justify spending hundreds of euros on an, an everlasting efficient cook stove uh, and at the same time be able to create a circular a commercial model that will actually reach more people. So there's always a trade-off in these things, but this is certainly over the next 10, 20 years, very much the way things need to be as we work towards better solutions. 
Super, thanks, John. Um, that's some um, useful information there. Um, so now there's a few questions uh, for Avoco. I'll read them out to you, Ahmad. So um, one is, how can an organization use the Avoco app? Is it only for individuals or can organizations use it? Another one, how does Evoco take into account fruit and vegetables grown by families in their gardens or allotments? Is that, can that be factored in, in, in using the app? Um, and then the third, this is the third question for you, Ahmad. How comprehensive is the algorithm behind Evoco? Does it distinguish between beef reared in different ways, the carbon efficiency of different supermarkets, supply chains, how it's wrapped, et cetera, et cetera? Does it take account of everything or, or how do you calculate that? Yeah. So um, I might start off with the allotments question. So um, I think definitely for the current use case that we have for the app, it works in kind of a supermarket environment. So it's like uh, you can take a photograph of the shopping receipt you get at that point. Um, I definitely think uh, uh, growing your own vegetables is a fantastic thing to do because it doesn't only uh, reduce, it, can't, it doesn't only just help you reduce your emissions also, but it is that kind of bringing that closer connection to nature and the food that you're actually eating that helps drive that kind of larger behavioral change and system change that we need. And then, um, sorry, she would remind me of the first question again. Um, the, can an organization use the Avaco app or is it just for individuals? Yeah, so currently we're um, uh, working just on kind of an individual basis and getting people to work, uh, I suppose, compete with their peers and um, use it amongst their friends. But um, I'm happy if anyone wants to drop me an email regarding kind of their organization, we can uh, speak about that kind of specific use case. And then when it comes to the, I suppose, the um, algorithm itself, so we partner with a Swiss data science company called Eternity. And what they do is they use life cycle analysis to give us the climate impact of our, um, of our food products. And life cycle analysis takes, um, I suppose, a product from when it's being, I suppose, as far back as it's being grown, all the way through its life cycle and it has a CO2 score um, associated with it. So uh, we take into account that production, the packaging and the transport uh, into the country for, um, uh, for that product itself. And at the moment, uh, just to kind of reflect the kind of environmental data that I, that's out there in the industry at the, at the moment, is that we can only get scores on the reference product level. So um, our scorings would be, uh, rather than giving you say a branded product, like say um, Avonmore milk, we give you a score based on say, uh, a two liter jug of milk produced in Ireland in October would have a specific score. And if there was more information um, available on the production practices, we can factor that in, but um, that'll be in further iterations as well. We'll get closer and closer as the industry improves. Great. So now we have a question for both of you uh, from Philip here, uh, thinking ahead, how can you catch businesses as they start up so that they incorporate um, environment and climate, et cetera, from the beginning, so they don't have to go through the whole change management. Um, and then he, he suggests different ways um, of approaching this from the beginning, like considering social return on investment from the start, you know, as opposed to kind of adapting later on or triple bottom line, things like that. Yeah, we go to I, 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 could, I could start with that. I think really it comes down to the people find, uh, founding that business. I would say that uh, touching on the question that um, uh, you, you had for us earlier, Sheila, that if, if the founders can really tie that, that core, whatever their core business function is, to some environmental or social impact, that'll make um, embedding that into their business a lot easier and they can set targets accordingly. So it won't be seen as a conflict as they're growing their businesses, whether something they do is purely for profits or if it's uh, sacrificing profits for environmental impact. It does make it more challenging at the beginning but um, it does force you to think outside the box and find business models that are more resilient and more, um, I suppose, sustainable for the future. But then also, I suppose the biggest supports that uh, we could get would be, um, I suppose, uh, governmental support. And for most kind of startups coming through the uh, Irish system, they'd be getting Enterprise Ireland support. And I suppose it'd be um, looking for institutes like that to actually have um, environmental policies and targets that they set for companies when they're starting off and also giving them the supportive materials so that they can actually um, create those targets and find ways to actually achieve them as well. Great, super, thank you. And I have a question here from a gentleman from Omana uh, for Ahmad. And he says that social entrepreneurship is essentially a race to ensure social impact while also achieving financial success in order to scale. 
The social impact of the app seems crystal clear, but I was wondering how it makes money to ensure sustainability of the organization and how to reckon technology has helped balancing both goals. So how do you make money? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, definitely, I think uh, that's always been uh, the big uh, the big question mark for any kind of social impact uh, company coming through. I think for us, really, it's coming down to one, uh, because we do provide uh, carbon offsets as well, that we do take a commission on um, the offsets that we provide for consumers through the app, but then also bringing in a premium subscription for users uh, who want to, uh, I suppose, avail of more tools within the app to reach uh, their goals to get within pantry boundaries quicker. I think further down the line, there's a lot of really interesting business models that uh, we can mess around with, but uh, that really comes down to us uh, reaching scale and finding partnerships with uh, different retailers and different food companies as well. But again, um, the reason we've we've had we've really kind of made it hard for ourselves in some ways, but have had that main focus that we're an impact first company. So anything, any business model that we go down needs to be aligned with. Um, um, aligned with the impact that we want to make. So it is that little bit slower in trying to find what are the kind of sustainable business models and making sure there's no conflicts of interest there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, social entrepreneurship is often presented as a win-win, you know, um, and there's often a lot of kind of um, positive values and positive spin put on this win-win. So there's always a social win, an environmental win, and a financial win. What happens when the two are in competition, when you have to make a tough choice between either social impact or environmental impact or financial success? Because in profit making businesses, surely this happens all the time. And I'm sure it happens for you as well. I wonder, could you give us a specific example and how you might reconcile that? Uh, who would like to go first? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd grab that one. Um, okay. Well, you know, um, there are... There, there is, we've never struck a balance between the commercial imperative and the social imperative. You know, for hundreds of years, it's profit maximization. Now there is a global groundswell towards um, not only social equity, social justice, but climate justice and climate change. So these things are coalescing. There's a very pivotal time you, where we're seeing a sea change right across the globe where people are aware of these two great global issues. Um, and, and so the financiers are addressing it, the businesses are addressing it, and the consumers are addressing it. So everyone is conscious that there's a new way forward and that you can actually raise cheaper cost of capital. There are sources, impact investment groups. We're accessing cost of capital at very, very good rates, below 5%, some below as low as 3% return because of the social offering. And uh, ultimately, the holy grail, you might say, would be where you have projects and commercial entities that deliver the best of development work, that it is truly combined. Now, that will not happen overnight, but maybe 20, 30, 50 years down the, down the road where this sea change uh, plays out, we could be looking at companies that are really satisfied with a lower return uh, because the triple bottom line means that much to their financiers, to their consumers, to their own ethos as an organization. So it's a progression, I think, we're only at the start of it, but if only 1% of the world's capital could be invested responsibly, that will have a dramatic effect on the planet in terms of poverty reduction. So we're not talking about dramatic uh, seismic shifts costing an arm and a leg necessarily, you're really talking about a shift from the greedy capitalist model that has put the world where it is today. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. That's some good good advice. How about you, Ahmad, in Avoco? Is it yeah. always a win-win? Um, exactly. I suppose it's, I'd agree with a lot of what John's saying there. It's, um, it's kind of looking at a couple of things. It's looking at firstly kind of um, at what scale are you looking at? Are you looking at the problem? It's, is it that you're looking to kind of make short-term financial gain today to uh, at the detriment of the environment or is it that you're kind of you have like this 50 50 decision where if where you need to kind of prioritize where you need to prioritize the environment first and then go to try and make your profits but i think um you really need to look at firstly for the, the profits like what are they what are they going to be used for and whose pockets i, I suppose are they going to go into as well 
because at the end of the day, when people are kind of pushing that we need to have keep having the growth and growth and uh, profits, only a very few people actually see those profits themselves. But then again, we shouldn't be shy about profits because there's something that uh, can fuel a lot of this kind of um, this system change that we actually need as well. And it is going to be a big driver for us. And it comes back to something that uh, Kate Rayward says in her book in kind of donut economics is that we should become indefinite, uh, indifferent when it comes to profit, but really, really bullish and positive when it comes to actually making an environmental and social impact. That at the end of the day, if we can make our businesses financially sustainable, then what we're trying to maximize should be, um, I suppose, helping the planet and society actually thrive uh, within our planetary boundaries. Brilliant. Thanks, Ahmad. Um, perhaps one fair, maybe fairly quick question for you, and then and then we'll go move on to our conclusions as we're coming to the end of our hour here. A question from Danielle. Um, have you, Ahmad, have you partnered with any chefs in creating educational practices, plant-based diets in particular, seem to have a learning curve? Maybe that's um, an idea for the future. Yeah, no, I think that would be, that's a fantastic, uh, that's a fantastic idea. We've had kind of, um, some kind of more informal kind of conversations with uh, different chefs, but I'd be really interested in hearing what you have in mind and you can probably take that offline by now. <laughs> yeah, super. Um, okay, so, um, I mean, one thing that I'd like to point out, there's, uh, I mean, we're, you know, I was thinking of all these different questions to ask you guys and picking holes in what you're doing and thinking about like bigger criticisms that have been out there in the discussion. And the, the phrase that came to mind for me is, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good you know, when no matter if you can do something, it's worthwhile uh, to do it. Um, and not not to, while we're looking at all of the intricacies here, not to let that slide. Um, but then another thing that has that is often overlooked, and it's the, something that I've focused on quite a bit is um, the legitimacy, the, as, the assumptions and values and norms and beliefs that come along with what you're doing. So just by the initiatives that you two are undertaking, you're shifting a little bit what is considered acceptable and what we can do and what we should do and that's what is underlies a lot of social change so you know while we can we, we often stick with like the technical changes or how to use the cook stove or how to implement the thing and how to but but actually sometimes it's just the fact that you are taking this initiative putting in huge effort and resources and thought and concern into these questions that actually helps shift the thing along um, and sometimes can be one of these tipping points that brings about this big social change that John has uh, referred to there. Um, because many people do say that we are at this point of social change and that, that changes are inevitable and they're coming and they, they're, we'll have to, it'll be climate adaptation because we will adapt to whatever happens either quickly <laughs> or suddenly or planned or completely unplanned one way or another it will be climate adaptation so that's kind of the discussion um and how it's going forward from now so um i'd just like to thank both of you for coming in for sharing your work with us for telling us about how it works and hopefully giving giving people some insights and some ideas of how you can actually combine social and environmental and financial goals. A lot of the discussion in this area tends to be fairly high level. Um, and you have, you have connected, I think, that high level stuff of what we need to be doing and the type of changes we need to be making with specific ways of how we do it. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. I've really enjoyed the discussion today and also to the audience, we've had some great questions there uh, and I didn't get to all of them, but hopefully we covered all the issues that, that came up. Uh, so thank you very much. And now I'm handing back to Susanna to close for the day. Uh, thanks so much, Sheila and John and Ahmad. That was really, um, really insightful and really appreciate that you took on such a challenging topic uh, and shared it with, with our community here. Um, webinar series. Um, thank you also to our technical host today, Alexandra Owens, as well as uh, my colleague Anna O'Loughlin, who's been helping out behind the scenes, and as well as, as Sheila's just said, to all of you, our attendees, for your, your questions, your engagement uh, throughout this webinar and through all of our webinars. We really appreciate it. If you'd like more information um, about the topics that were being discussed today, you can see the uh, URLs that are at the bottom of your screen. And just to note that these will also be sent in the follow-on email uh, in the next couple of days. So you don't need to frantically try and scribble all of them down right now. And if you do have any questions about the this webinar or the webinar series, please contact us 
in the alumni office at alumni at tcd.ie. Uh, the Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar series will be taking a break until the autumn. Uh, we are already lining up a great mix of speakers who will continue to bring thought-provoking topics to you, and we'll be sharing the schedule towards the end of the summer. We really want to thank you for your continued engagement and support of the Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar series and to all of our speakers that we've had throughout the past year. It has been a pleasure to connect with our alumni and friends around the world, uh, and we look forward to welcoming you back in the autumn. So thanks again to Sheila, John, and Ahmad. I thank you to all for listening, and please stay safe and have a wonderful summer. Thank you.